value of Marvel trading cards. For those of you who this is your first time stumbling across my page, I'm a career data scientist, have 10 plus years of experience in analytics. I moonlight at comic cons and run data science panels. So you might have sat in on one of my panels before. I analyze Pokemon data, video game data, comic book data, um, teaching people how to improve their game play in Mario Kart, uh, survival analysis for Game of Thrones, uh, answering fun Comic Con questions, as in which superhero would win in a battle by supporting it with data. You might have come across my book on Amazon as well. It's a Pokemon data science book, and it's great for the young, aspiring data scientist or anyone who's early on in their career or just looking for a career switch or who loves Pokemon. So that's enough about that. Let's get into this analysis, which is titled, With Great Data Comes Great Insights. Here's what we're going to cover. An overview of Marvel card sales. I'm going to explain to you really quick what's included in the analysis. I'm going to show you a high-level impact of the MCU. A casual impact time series analysis, which we'll use to evaluate more impact on a detailed level. Loki versus Daredevil. I'm going to show you my propensity score in action that I developed and what you should take away from this analysis as a whole. So let's begin with our overview of Marvel card sales. Marvel cards value saw impact in February and October. So what I did was here's a high level of all Marvel card sales via eBay Terapeak over the past 12 months. And you can really see two big spikes, one in February 2021 and then also in October 2021. So what is really going on? A couple of events happen in February, right? The Disney Plus shows launch. Uh, we also have the new interest in a 1990 Marvel Universe Impel set, which both of these events are helping drive up a total sold cards. And then in October, so Q4, we actually see an increase in average dollars sold per card. And really the drivers are precious metal gems and modern sets, which is really putting the focus on serial cards, serial numbered cards. So limited cards, more rarity, higher value. So the point that I was talking about February is actually Marvel card sales more than tripled, right? So if I look at 30 days prior to WandaVision launch versus 30 days post, we actually see a 256% increase in total sales of Marvel cards. We actually have more sellers as well, 72%. Uh, just total cards sold, 130%. And then the average price increased by 55%. I do want to call out when you look at this graph over time, right? There is a decline that you can kind of correlate to PSA turning off its value segments, right? And other grading companies also being delayed in grading time as they are picking up demand from PSA shutting down. Right, so makes you think that probably most of the sales in February were coming from people who are looking to grade and flip or just grade their own personal collection, right? So grading is also very new to Marvel cards. Let me talk about that October period in Q4. I look at these same core KPIs, use the same approach, all I see is a 6% increase in average sold price, which aligns with serial numbered cards, right? There's fewer of them out there, but they're higher priced. 
Another hypothesis on why it's the only thing that increased is, well, Q3 had a lot of Disney Plus shows, Marvel movie. So the comparison period, you almost like having to come over a mountain. So that plus 6% increase really speaks to the value of those rare cards. So now I want to answer what I'm going to analyze in this in more detail and what I'll leave for later, right? So I'll focus on that f February period, those events that led to it, Disney Plus and Impel Rookies. Reason why is that there's been several events, several releases, more cards, more sales, and there's plenty of time, right? It can span almost the entire 12 months, this analysis. I'm going to leave the October events for another analysis, right? Because I'll need to use a different approach, really let the um, interesting things that are going on in the marketplace, such as reselling of certain PMGs, all this is happening pretty frequently and it's new to the market. So we'll need to approach that later on. Let's get some more data. So this analysis spans over 170K in sales and a year's time period, right? So total cards sold, I analyze almost 175,000 cards. Total sales, I analyzed a little bit over $6 million in sales and total sellers over 34,000. I looked at this over the past 12 months, right? So, and I included the five Marvel events. I'll go into the ones I excluded soon. So I included WandaVision, Loki, Black Widow, Falcon and Winter Soldier, and the trailer for Spider-Man No Way Home. So that's three Disney Plus shows, a movie and a trailer. I'm trying to really understand also if there's any differences based off of the type of Marvel event it is. So I excluded the What If series because almost every character is featured in that, right? So I wouldn't be able to have a control group. Without a control group, we can't get to incrementality and true lift of these MCU events. I also excluded Shang-Chi just because there wasn't enough pre-sales of Shang-Chi cards before the movie. So I would have been overstating the lift. But hopefully I give you a proxy on percentages, coefficients that you can use to evaluate those types of cards in the future. So this gets us into treatment cards. Treatment cards are any characters that are being featured in these Disney Plus shows, movies. So think of Loki, Kang, Black Widow, Spider-Man, Dr. Octopus, Scarlet Witch, Vision, Falcon, Winter Soldier. All featured in these events. Our control group is going to be the 1990 Marvel and Pell set, Series 1, and Daredevil. So Daredevil is a control, and I'll go into that later on, about propensity match with Loki. So you probably got some questions on that control group. So let's break the fourth wall, interrupt the analysis a little bit. So all control groups, right, can have holes shot into it. Nothing's going to be clear cut. Reason being is that they can be exposed to the treatment without knowing it, right? So the same noise that happens in the treatment could potentially happen in the control group, and you just have to hope that the impact is minimal. So take, for example, a black cat, black cat card being listed on eBay could have the word Spider-Man in the title, could be because they're trying to get more views or just the set, right? So this is where I think it's going to have minimal impact. 
because it potentially is happening more often than you think. So it's going to be controlled for in both groups. <coughs> Let's use our first data science technique, which is going to be propensity modeling. I just gave you on the screen the technical term for if you want to know. But essentially what it's going to do, it's going to give me a score of 0 to 1 for every Marvel character based off of what I'm trying to predict, what they have the propensity to do. And in this case, I leveraged a Twitter poll by Marvel. It was called Battle Royale, and Twitter users voted on which character would win in a matchup. So I then took back-end data from the mobile app game Marvel Contest of Champions, which had power levels, attack levels, health levels, defense, and use that to predict how many votes they would receive from the poll. So this is a technique to balance everyone and get look-alike approaches. So over here I'm just showing you how if you don't do this propensity score, this balancing, it's very hard to put all Marvel on a scale together. If I look at it by attack, Rocket Raccoon's up there, if I look at it by health, you got King Groot, then Modok. Then if I look at it by power index, Thanos is number one. You even have Medusa jump in there as well as Green Goblin. So using all of those to predict the score will balance it nicely. Another question you probably have is where are you getting your sales data from? Well, I'm getting it from eBay's Terra Peak. So as of this analysis, it's behind the paywall, which I really don't like to put things behind paywall, but this isn't me, this is eBay. Uh, you need a subscription as a seller. But this allows me to search for individual cards, different keywords, and see the last 12 years of data. Sorry, 12 months of data. I take that back. So look at the MCU impact at a glance, right? So before I break down into incrementality, just overall, which is probably what you're hearing from most channels, right? So I'm gonna look at 30 days prior versus 30 days post a Marvel event. It's all time aligned, right? So that means everyone has equal 30 pre and post, regardless of when they launched. So 17% increase in total Marvel cards sold, 14% average price sold, 33% total Marvel card sales, 20% total Marvel card sellers. Good healthy growth, right? So really it's driving short-term impact. The MCU is driving only an incremental 2% increase in average price sold. So what does that mean? I'm talking about how much more does the test group, so featured in an MCU event, drive in sales versus those who weren't, their control group, right? So our impact lowers, but it's true. It's more real. It's an accurate statement. These are where you want to apply those coefficients if you want to get an idea of like, okay, what can I expect if I was to sell a card during an MCU event, and I'm pretty sure they're featured in it over the next 30 days, it'll probably most likely sell for 2% higher than it was before. Part of that is because you'll actually have 11% more sellers selling the same card, 16% more cards sold, and just all of Marvel increasing its sales as a whole. That's where you get into supply and demand, correct? Now, each event isn't different, isn't the same, right? They're all different. Actually, in this data, right? Falcon and the Winter Soldier drives the most impact, not only short-term, but long-term. 
So if I look at just those 30 day periods, right, right after most recent impact, that halo period, the trailer for Spider-Man No Way Home, all those treatments actually saw an increase of 29%. The highest in this group, WandaVision actually showed the lowest impact. And part of that reason is because of timing, right? In February, that's when Marvel Impel set was really being preferred by everyone. Everyone was buying it up. That's our control group. Now over the next 30 days, I'm trying to look for that elasticity, stickiness, long-term effects. Falcon and the Winter Soldier is actually seeing a 46% increase. Loki now is in the positive. Spider-Man No Way Home trailer is actually decreased. And this is where we start talking about the different type of Marvel events, right? So movies, trailers are going to have a much shorter impact. The TV show is showing in this has a longer sustainable impact on cards. But it's still... Is only going to last about 60 days. That's what it's showing. True impact, 30 days after it happens. So now let me walk you through casual impact time series. In this case, we're going to run a multi-linear regression. I want to answer a few things, right? I want to know what's driving average card sold per seller, and then what's also driving average price sold per seller, right? So the amount of cards, and the price. We're going to look at Pancake's propensity score. That's the number of 0 to 1 that is trying to predict the amount of Twitter votes. I'm trying to get a sense of fan favorites, are cards written well, and just did the character matter? Or does it matter more that, hey, an event is happening? Season, so either 30 days pre, 36 post for the next 60 days, right? If 30 days prior that pre-period shows up, right? That's really another indicator of just the type of card, the rarity, right? If it's already driving a high value, does it even show even more of an increase because of an MCU show? And then featured Marvel character, right? That simple yes or no in the MCU at the time of sale. So let's look at our results. So a lot of coefficients, a lot of graphs, validation steps, but I'll walk you through what this all means. Don't have a mind explosion right now. So being featured in the MCU drives total cards sold, right? So that means the top driver was, are you in the MCU or not? Surprise, surprise. This is also the top driver for just average price sold as well. So this was expected as we already saw there was incremental, incremental increases from the previous slides. So now let's go into just the MCU alone. And this is where it starts to get interesting, right? The top driver is actually the propensity score. So the type of character they are matters more than the timing, right? Whether it was the pre, the 30 days, or the next 30 days. So type of character matters. So I want to show you also how this propensity lookalike works. So we run the propensity score. I'm looking for a match for Loki. It identifies Daredevil as a match because statistically they are the same character according to this. So their number is 0.54. So this actually puts them smack in the middle of the Marvel Universe. So when you're talking about averages, this could potentially tell you most about your population. So these numbers are going to be comparing Loki against Daredevil. 
within the first 30 days after an MCU event that Loki's involved in, right? We see an increase of average price by 11%. Average card sold 27%. This is all good news, aligning with our broader results as well. Then we come to the 60-day period, which is interesting, right? So the next 30 days, we actually see average prices increase by 44%, but we're actually seeing a decrease in items sold, right? So downwards of 9%. So you can interpret that as maybe potentially Loki's price has just naturally gone up. Maybe rarer cards are up, more serial cards. But this is against Daredevil alone. So this is where we're starting to see that true impact of the MCU on the character-specific level. Now, you can use this approach also on certain sets, right? I would just have to run a propensity model based on these sets, not the characters itself. If you would find value in that, just always reach out to me on Instagram and we can discuss it uh, at pancake underscore analytics for that one. So finally, this is what I want you to take away from this analysis. The MCU is driving short-term impact on value, right? So just over the next 30 days is true impact. And that aligns with anything that you see in marketing, sales data. That's why these models are accurate when it comes to trading card hobby, right? It's because really I'm just trying to predict behaviors of buyers, right? I'm not trying to predict really the value of a card itself. You're just trying to predict if it will be sold and at what price. I'm not predicting true value. This is all about seller mentality, buyer mentality, the market. So impact actually lessens when we look at a control group, right? So this is true impact. So the, the time period that the impact is shorter and the true lift is actually shorter as well. So, but you can say 2% increase in sales coming from the MCU. There's gonna be more sellers when an MCU event is happening. So what do you wanna do as a collector, right? If you're looking to move some items of MCU members, you probably want to do it sooner than later once the show launches. If you're looking to buy, you do not want to buy during an MCU event. If you're trying to get it at the lowest price point, right? So essentially, what this analysis is showing you is that there's now an in-season and an off season for Marvel cards. So hopefully you enjoyed this and just continue collecting what you like. If it's Marvel cards, we got something in common. Really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to let me speak to you about data.